Good afternoon and welcome everyone. I'm David Jernigan. I'm an associate professor in the Department of Health, Behavior, and Society, and I am very thrilled to welcome all of you to this important panel on the implications of changes in the information ecosphere for public health promotion policy and politics. We have terrific panelists. I look forward to an enlightening discussion. It's my pleasure to introduce the panel moderator, Lori Dorfman, and then she'll introduce the panelists. This panel has, in fact, grown out of my contacts with Lori, as well as Jeff, Kathy, others over the years. Uh, Lori's the executive director of the Berkeley Media Studies Group, which is a nonprofit organization dedicated to expanding advocates' ability to improve the systems and structures that determine health. BMSG trains advocates and journalists, does framing and content analyses in support of public health policy campaigns, and develops and disseminates case studies in public health advocacy from which we all learn. I first got to know Lori when she was a DRPH student at Berkeley and worked for me at the Marin Institute. She was a terrific employee, of course, but the best part was what she called our after six conversations. When we were off the clock and we had long talks about change and philosophy and media and postmodernism and journalism and media advocacy. And those conversations have continued through the years and have led to a variety of collaborations, including this panel. It is my great pleasure to introduce and expose you to the insightful, knowledgeable, committed, committed and witty woman known as Laurie Dorfman. Oh my goodness, that's a lot to live up to. I haven't even stepped up here yet. Wow, okay. Gee, David, after six, that's, that's what we called it. They were, they were the best conversations. Okay, so good afternoon, everybody. I'm really delighted to be here. This panel's very exciting, and what I'm gonna do is really just take a couple of minutes here, give us a public health anchor so that we have kind of a, way, a lens to look through this issue at, and then I'm gonna invite up our panelists, and we, David did a great job because this is kind of a dream panel. When you're a moderator, you don't have to know anything about the topic, you just have to have good questions. And I've got so many questions for these guys, so it's really great. So the thing about us in public health, as most of you know, because I assume most of you are public health practitioners or students, is you know we're a very pragmatic sort. We come to this field we're motivated by social justice, many of us, but really we want to get things done and we want to improve environments in which people live and we're not really the most theoretical bunch. Elsewhere on this campus you're going to find people thinking about deep theory, but not here so much. For a long time, just the idea of agent, host, and environment kind of satisfied our needs and we could figure out, you know, what was going on, what were the risk factors, how could you reduce exposure to those risk factors, and, and then, you know, as infectious diseases gave way to chronic diseases, suddenly it got a bit more complicated than that. And so where we are now is in a realm we call the social determinants of health. Wow, what is that? So that has to do with education, economics, uh, community, social activities. I, I, on the train on the way here, I used my phone because you know it seemed appropriate given the panel to say, well, what happens when I type in social determinants of health? And I'm just gonna read you one little paragraph at the top of the WHO, the World Health Organization's page on social determinants of health. The social determinants of health are the conditions in which people are born, grow, live, work, and age. These circumstances are shaped by the distribution of money, power, and resources at global, national, and local levels. The social determinants of health are mostly responsible for health inequities, the unfair and avoidable differences in health status seen within and between countries. Okay, wow. We've come a long way now. We need to understand this a little bit differently, and we need to understand it in a much deeper way, and we have to really understand how the sectors of society are, con are connected here if we're gonna do something about population level health, which is what we're interested in. Not any given individual. This isn't about individual health. The people who say, if I just save one life, no, 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 no. 
In public health, we're about whole populations. So we have to think about how these systems work together. And when people list the social determinants of health, interestingly, they never really list media. Yet those of us who have been thinking about this after six and other times understand that if we're going to change those systems and structures, we have to get the attention of policymakers. If we want to get the attention of policymakers, we have to pay attention to what they pay attention to, and they pay attention to the news. That's what brings David and I to a study and practice of media advocacy and a deep interest in what's happening to our media system and how it has influenced the political structures that are charged with ensuring that we have a society that we can all live in together and thrive in. And that's what brings us to this panel because there are big changes happening now in the realm of media that are getting um, at, at the same time they're transparent, they're completely invisible. And so this panel is going to help us understand them. They're transparent a little bit because we all carry these things in our hand. So we're subject to them, we're participating in a media infrastructure in a way we never have before, yet a lot of what's going on there is behind the scenes. So our panels are going to help pull that curtain back. We'll hear from each of them, and then we'll have a discussion about it all together. The panelists, we're going to start with Jeff Chester, who heads the Center for Digital Democracy. Jeff is a public interest advocate. He has been an investigative reporter. He's the person in the nation, I think, who does the most to investigate and understand how the marketers and big data retailers and media I hate to call it an ecosystem because that makes it sound like it's natural. It's not natural. People made it, you know, so, but, oh, oh yeah, well, so the, he, he's taken a really close look at how the companies talk to each other and what they are promising in the way of collecting our big data. And he is well connected to the privacy groups that have been trying to protect that aspect of our social life. Daniel Kreese is going to go next. He has been looking really closely at how Twitter and other social media systems have been influential in our political debates and our political elections. And he'll also connect that to this big data infrastructure we're going to talk about. Jonathan Albright is really the person, I think, who instigated this panel because he did some research that investigated how the quote unquote fake news ecosystem, oh, I hate using all three of those words together, <laughs> has manifest and how it has been brought to bear through Facebook and social media on the information we get and how we understand that information and what information is limited and what we have access to and things like that. I'm going to let him explain it because obviously I'm out of my depth here. And then after that, we'll have Catherine Montgomery from American University. And Kathy's going to talk to us about uh, the, the actual physical wearableness of these devices. You know, in public health, that seems like a promise. If we could just get people their data and their information, wouldn't that motivate them to do the things they need to do individually to be healthier? And part of that's true. Some of us just needed to know if we broke a sweat once a day, we could probably live a longer and healthier life, and, and our little devices help us do that. Of course, others of us know the information it doesn't seem to make that much of a difference. So we know there's more than information going on here. And we also know that there is a huge amount of very intimate and personal data being collected through these devices that kind of gets sent off into the somewhere. And, and an examination back, linking back to privacy and the connections of big data is very important if we're going to understand how all this works together. So I'm going to invite the first panelist up, which is Jeff Chester. We'll go rapid fire as, as you, they each give you about 10 minutes, and then we'll sit down and have a conversation. So okay, thank you, Jeff. <laughs> um, well, you know, I'm, you did remind me these are public. So it's too late to really do any primary intervention. So are we really, we, we only can do tertiary at this point, right? And that's, that's something I think we can talk about at the end. I want to thank Professor Jernig and David uh, for organizing this panel. I'm delighted to be here with uh, distinguished colleagues. Clearly, this issue has broad implications for, for public health, the work that you do and colleagues on this campus do in terms of service delivery, you know, research, and public policy. Think about what just happened. 
Or think about what's happening to Obamacare, support for low-income low individuals on Medicaid, support for science and research, even what drugs people are sold. All those things are determined by public policy, by who we elect. And as you can see from the last election, we have put much of our public health infrastructure and the scientific research infrastructure at risk, let alone the greater implications to democratic societies and human freedom. All of these things, I think, are impinged by the system that I, and I'm sure my colleagues will talk about. Now, one of my favorite phrases from, a, from the Facebook management, um, when they gave a speech, one of the VPs for advertising gave a speech, by the way, tell me when the 10 minutes are up, gave a speech to European advertisers. I mean, if you really want to understand the digital marketing industry, which I think is one of the most strongest forces in the world determining kind of our collective future, you have to really follow them, what they say, all around the world. And, and luckily, or unfortunately, American companies play an incredibly important role in, in the construction of our, of our digital lives. And you can uh, read what they say in English, whether they're talking to people in China, you know, or, or Brazil, or, or Europe, or here. But what the vice president of Facebook told the advertisers, the big advertisers at Khan not too long ago was, our job is curating the identities of our users. And that meant, I believe, that they really saw their role as taking all of the incredible second-by-second second information they have on individuals and their relationships with their friends and, and social networks and use it to advance their interests to make profits. So we are living in a in an era where the, un I wrote this up, so I'm going to read, where the unconstrained forces of mass personalized data collection facilitated by sophisticated machine learning technologies, as well as capabilities to assemble and deliver persuasive content to individuals and groups increasingly in real time, is at the foundation of, our, of digitally connected societies around the world. These forces just help elect Trump, they certainly played a role, and I'm sure we'll talk about it, in, in President Obama's election. It played a role in Brexit. And there are many, many factors and, and a great deal to debate about what just happened in this election. Uh, in, in disinformation, propaganda, reaction to the global economy. There's the role of money in politics. And by the way, if you haven't looked at reports by Jane Mayer or Matea Gold about the Mercers. I hope my colleagues may mention the Mercers. I think it's worth looking at what happens when uh, a very uh, uh, wealthy individual with a political agenda uh, is able to um, um, shape an outcome. But let's look at the, uh, this is a, this is a, um, a slide uh, from SCL, um, which is, which is the, the UK kind of branch of Cambridge Analytica, and you can see what they say. They do a lot of behavioral micro targeting. I captured this in December when I wrote a story about this issue for, for Bill Moyers, and, and it's, it's worth looking at what, what, what they say. But let's look at a quick, because I think what Cambridge Analytica did, and they worked for Trump, to me was emblematic of the, of the capabilities of the frame that digital advertisers, especially Google and Facebook, but involving many, many others, articulate on a regular basis. So what Cambridge says they do or did is what advertisers do when they sell us credit cards and junk food and prescription drugs, et cetera. So let's see their PR. Now, somebody actually has to help me because I didn't even ask how to run this PowerPoint. <laughs> Thanks. Yeah. Let's run this little video.
you know, what's striking to me about this, um, I mean, look, Cambridge Analytica is one of the firms that worked for, for the Trump campaign. We, we'll discuss, I'm sure, what their role uh, was. I mean, one of the interesting things, one of the most disturbing things, how do I do this? Interesting one of the most disturbing ask. things was that, that they talked about they engaged in voter suppression, that they found African Americans, I think it was in Chicago and others, and, and, and sent them messages via Facebook so they wouldn't come out and vote uh, for, for, for Hillary uh, uh, Clinton. And interestingly, too, they just won the global advertising industry's highest award for their use of big data. I said they should call it the Big Brother Award, not the Big Data Award. So the industry, either, uh, both I think to get favor with the Trump people, but also a kind of reflection of what they did. Because you know, you could look at this video and you could look at any other digital marketing video and it would be the same. It's the same story because it reflects the current capabilities and intent of the system. And I'm really here to talk to you about the underlying system that's been put in place of which the political parties are now able to take full advantage of. And you know, you can go on the website and, and, um, um, and you can look at Cambridge Analytica and, and their role here of uh, the use of, of, of big data. But I want to get to this next point. Look. What's happened over the last few years? We live, unfortunately, from my work in unregulated, uh, you know, digital media economy. I mean, you know, my organization has been one of the few that have been able to successfully pass uh, legislation protecting privacy, and that was in 1998 when Catherine and I uh, led the campaign that resulted in the in the uh, Children's Online Privacy Protection Act. Once you turn 13 in this country, you have no protections. How many of you know about the fact that Congress and the FCC, uh, Congress and President Trump uh, eliminated a privacy rule that would have protected you when you go on broadband networks? Raise your hand. Okay, that most of you. Well, I helped get that through. And that, that was in October. And that would have been the only safeguard. Wouldn't have affected Google and Facebook directly. But that would have been the only safeguard uh, to protect you and, and to kind of address the system I'm about to talk about. And by the way, Google and Facebook opposed that privacy uh, rule, which is one reason why it got defeated. Over the last few years, in, uh, in part because of our use of mobile devices and, 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 um, and social media, and, be, and, be, and because advertising fuels the, the digital system, and because companies like Google and Facebook are primarily advertising companies, that's how they make all their money. And the fact that the advertisers now realize, that, the, and marketers and political parties, that they have access to us 24-7. In fact, one of the reasons this technology has evolved the way it has is because advertisers were worried that we were no longer stuck in front of our TVs, but, but uh, using our PCs and, and mobile devices. So over the last few years, there have been incredible breakthroughs for the advertisers, not for our public, not for our privacy. They're now able to, to, to track you regardless of what device you use, increasingly including television and identify you as a single person. They couldn't do that two or three years ago, right? They, you, would, you would be on your mobile phone, and then you'd be on your PC, and they couldn't put two and two together. No, no. They had, to, they had to make sure that they could identify you wherever you went. And because of our use of mobile devices, we're constantly giving off signals one way or another, either through the phone or for the apps, et cetera. They've wired the country, slicing and dicing it, it into micro-neighborhoods to know when we walk by stores, you know, in order to figure out where we shop and who we are, et cetera, right? They're able to, to take uh, our offline and online information and merge it so they have a full array of, of information about us. And they've established huge data marketing clouds, so-called clouds, and there's so many of them now. And, and there's been huge consolidation in the data industry. There's one-stop shopping for, every, for if you want information about you, you know, your, your sex, your race, your income, what you buy, what you do online, your political leanings, you could, in a flip of a switch, whether it's Oracle or Adobe or Nielsen or Salesforce, will provide that to marketers and advertisers. And of course, if you're Google and Facebook, you already know so much more about us. Are you kidding? Are you kidding? Okay. Now, so look, so the same, the same technologies that sell us soap and sell us fast food, right, 
and, the, and in a way, the same research system that tries to figure out, you know, what are emotional vulnerabilities? This is from Facebook, its most recent research, where they're using neuromarketing to figure out, you know, how can we, whether or not what we do really influences people at the profound level. That is the paradigm that has been established that has concerned me for a number of years. That the business model, basically, for the digital industry is this. I collect everything you do. I know everything you do. I know what your friends do. I'm making predictions. And I'm deploying, I'm, I'm testing it to figure out whether it bypasses your conscious mind, right, if it really triggers your emotions. And I'm using all that information to persuade you to do different things. And maybe we're at the beginning of this system. But, sir, but, but what, give me an ex extra minute. So what happened, in 27, what happened in 2016 was, as far as I'm concerned, that for the first time, all the political parties, including Bernie and I love him, to Trump, used a full array of, 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 of digital marketing tools, including buying and selling individuals in 20 milliseconds or less, which is how advertising is conducted today. That's called programmatic. Google and Facebook, this is from Google, this is from Facebook, opened up its doors, worked closely with both parties and special interest groups so they could use the full array of the tools to engage the public to achieve uh, their, their aims. And so, this is an unregulated system. We've already, see, we've already seen what, what the consequences are. Uh, there already are, are some proposed safeguards in, uh, that are, there already are some safeguards being proposed, certainly in Europe, and I look forward to discussing this issue with you. Thanks. I'm not, I don't even have to get behind the podium, Ben. Just take it away. All right, I will, let me. I should be, perfect. All right, um, I'll set a stopwatch, so, so it's, um, first of all, thank you for this invite. This is such a wonderful event. Um, in 10 minutes, I want to just provide sort of a big, broad overview of the role of social media in the 2016 election. Um, this comes from some of my own research, as well as work I've been doing with my colleagues, uh, Regina Lawrence at University of Oregon and Shannon McGregor. Uh, at University of Texas at Austin. Um, but I want to provide you all with sort of just big broad themes that we can then sort of uh, talk about um, uh, as we sort of do the Q&A later on. Um, the first thing we need to talk about when we talk about social media is change. Um, I love starting all my talks with this slide. Um, this is Michael Slaby, who's the CTO of Obama 2008 and the Chief Integration and Innovation Officer of Obama 2012 and worked for an Eric Schmidt-backed um, uh, Hillary Clinton infrastructural organization in 2016. But the basic point was is that after 2008, from the outside, it looked like the Obama campaign was perfect, right? They harnessed Facebook. Um, they used new tools, et cetera. But coming back in 2012, they sort of realized that, first of all, things weren't perfect. Um, but second of all, the world moves on us, right? Things just change. New platforms uh, come up. Um, so one of the things, I published my first book in 2012, um, and I was uh, panicked for a minute. I was like, I don't remember ever writing about Twitter. And I found like a little footnote about Twitter, and then I realized that Obama's victory tweet in 2008 got 157 retweets. <laughs> and when I asked their new media director, I was like, who wrote your Twitter feed? He said it was an intern or somebody in the basement. Right? Fast forward four, four years in 2012, Twitter's at the center of political universe. In 2016, this story was Snapchat. Um, it was just a still from Bernie Sanders' geofilter. Um, but basically, Snapchat has more users than Twitter at about 150 million, including 41% of 18 to 34 year olds in the United States, and two thirds of them are actual voters. All right? This platform didn't exist in anywhere near its current form back in 2012, so campaigns need to figure out how do we leverage this, particularly to reach younger voters. Interesting, we can talk about their analytics platform during the election cycle was a mess. Um, they did not return good data back to candidates, um, which is constantly something that campaigns need to navigate. So change is the first theme. Second, the role of candidates. This is something that I think is often overlooked when we think about just the mechanics and the process um, of using social media. We tend to assume that um, voters are just sort of there to be targeted, but actually what we're targeting, um, the message, the content, the person we're selling, the cause, 
matters as well. So one of the points that a number of people talk to me about um, with respect to why the two big breakout social media candidates in this cycle were Donald Trump and Bernie Sanders. Um, this idea of authenticity, right? Um, and authenticity is such a difficult concept. We never know whether somebody's authentic or not. There's no way we can ever possibly understand that. Um, but according to Jeff Alexander and other scholars who have studied this from a sociological perspective, what's important about authenticity is that if you can convince your audience that you're authentic, that's what matters for all intents and purposes, right? So one of the stories I think of this election is that, and this comes from Katie Harbath who runs the global politics team for Facebook, um, is that Trump and Sanders in particular were seen as very deeply authentic candidates. Um, they weren't seen as being conventional politicians. They were seen as these outsiders, these insurgents who could be themselves, right? Speak their language and at the end of the day, go directly to their audience um, with it. And indeed, this is what Donald Trump did, I think, exceedingly well. So let's take out data entirely for a second um, or anything else his campaign might have done. This is just a quick screenshot of, of his Facebook Live of his events after the election. For the third debate, Donald Trump pulled down 9 million people tuning in on Facebook Live backstage and then watched the debate on Trump's Facebook Live. They were also able to raise $9 million off of that. That's a larger audience than tuned in to watch it on uh, ABC during the election, okay? No targeting, no data. They did run some ads to promote it, et cetera. But a lot of this phenomenon was people who were attracted to the Trump message. Right? And I think that's important that we don't forget about that. This wasn't about mass manipulation of people. This was about people being drawn to Donald Trump. Um, my favorite book about this election that wasn't about this election, it was published in advance, Strangers in Their Own Land, um, by Arlie Hochschild, a sociologist at Berkeley. Um, it's a brilliant book. One of the points that she makes is that Donald Trump released people from the emotional feeling rules they felt like they needed to have ways they needed to be politically correct, ways they felt like, particularly rural whites, um, they needed to, to care about minorities, care about um, uh, homosexuals and the like. People didn't want to do that. That's what they were attracted to about Donald Trump. They liked that he was willing to buck those rules. He played off of whiteness, he played off of masculinity, and people were attracted to that message. What's important, though, is that candidates have to perform this. Uh, this was the social media director um, for Bernie Sanders basically talking about, look, at the end of the day, Bernie wants us to talk about issues because that's who we are as Bernie Sanders, right? This is how Bernie Sanders is in person. Um, and it turns out that that is what resonated with people. It wasn't a hyper-targeted message. It was Bernie talking about policy in the ways that connected with people and the audiences he was trying to reach at the end of the day. And it was Bernie being Bernie. Uh, and it was seen as not something that was prepackaged. Again, it's a performance of authenticity. We'll never actually know. Um, but at the end of the day, what they tried to do is fashion their social media along these lines and in these directions. Okay, we talk about audiences. Um, often what gets lost in the shuffle when we talk about social media is the fact that social media is not a single entity. Um, in fact, many different platforms have many different audiences and many different uses. And it helps us to keep this in mind because if you're thinking about public health, you have to think about, well, which message and which genre for which audiences on which platform, all right? Let me walk you through this now for a minute. Um, Facebook is the largest channel. Facebook reaches everyone. Jeff alluded to this before. Um, it's the least insular, right? One of the, the primary audiences for Twitter, and I found this time and again in my work, is professional journalists in the political class. Um, it is a very specialized niche medium, mostly people who are already convinced um, uh, that politics is important. They follow it in their daily lives, but those are not the majority of Americans. The majority of Americans is on Facebook. And what they try to do is use Facebook to break through and get their message out. This is Caroline McCain, who's the social media director for Rubio 2016. Um, Twitter is a super niche audience, primarily used to set the agenda and the frames of the professional press. Um, that's how campaigns use, use Twitter as opposed to Facebook. Um, now, as Jeff alluded to, Facebook and data in particular underlies everything campaigns do on social media. This is a screenshot of the tech and data infrastructure for the Obama 2012 campaign. I have no time to get into this in detail. Um, I talk about this extensively in my most recent book, Prototype Politics. But real quickly, 
Um, down here is where the Democratic Party voter file lives. It has about 800 data points on every member of the electorate. The core of that is public information. Um, so those are things like party registration, real estate records, um, uh, DMV records, census data, et cetera, race and ethnicity, depending on which uh, state you live in, et cetera. Um, all of that gets fed through and brought together with other commercial databases um, that get bought and sold and traded, um, uh, as well as what I call just gifted data. Every time a canvasser shows up at your door and asks you who you might be supporting in this election, whether you might be likely to turn out to vote, what issues matter to you, that gets captured and goes into the Democratic Party's data file, and that gets built up over election cycles. Um, my book chronicles the history of the two parties' databases over the last two decades. Um, but real briefly, what we saw in 2012, really for the first time, was ways in which this then got married to analytics um, and HP's Vertica, which is a cloud-based system uh, for doing analytics um, on top of that. And then that informs everything else that candidates do. So what they try to do is take that eight, those 800 data points and distill them down into broader categories of voters. So which are likely to be supporting your candidate, um, which are likely to be supporting the opposition, which appeals um, might be uh, uh, um, uh, used to persuade somebody, uh, who's likely to turn about and who's, and who's not. And on that basis, they construct their entire campaign from field to finance to up here on top, which is digital, right? So you take these broad categories of voters and then you figure out, well, how do we reach them online, right? Um, and one of the reasons why this is important in politics is because the media audience is just far more fragmented than it used to be, right? Um, you can run an ad in the 1960s and reach 90% of the American electorate. Um, now, uh, just advertising on the three broadcast firms, now to do anything close to that, you'd have to be on hundreds of different channels across hundreds of different platforms. Um, this is Ali J. Asselstein. She works with uh, US Republican politics, just talking about what Google does uh, for candidates. Um, broadly, they sit down and work with campaigns to try to figure out who are we going to reach, what sorts of voting blocks. Um, and then it's Google Analytics team that then sits down and says, well, this is the way that we're going to reach them. This is what moms look like online. This is how we find them. These are millennial behavioral trends online. This is what we should do to reach them. They help them optimize their targeting strategy. And what's important here is that in the digital space, um, engagement is what's monetized. So Google and Facebook have an interest in increasing the performance of their ads because they make money on the basis of that. Okay, I have a couple more slides. I know I'm about 10 minutes now, so let me run through this. Um, next, when you think about social media, we have to think about affordances, right? That's a simply very fancy science technology studies way of saying what a technology actually does and what I perceive that it does. So what's important about this? Well, here's a great example. Um, uh, Chris Georgia, Bush 2016, talking about how for most of the 2016 election, Instagram wouldn't support outside links. So it became a very limited tool for electoral politics and was mostly used as a way to communicate broader sort of cultural stances of the candidate. So um, one of the things I think underlying politics, Laurie started us off talking about how we all want people to thrive. We have very different definitions uh, in the two parties of what thriving means. Um, George Bush, for, uh, Jeb Bush, for example, um, clearly thinks that second, strong Second Amendment rights is something that defines thriving communities, right? Um, so this is, uh, Instagram was a platform to signal these more cultural appeals. Um, real briefly, too, another aspect of affordances is the fact that on Facebook, if you post content, not everyone sees it. Twitter is mostly a chronological mechanism, which means everyone you follow, you see that content. On Facebook, it depends on how people engage with it, and that elevates content. So campaigns have come up with interesting ways to try to work around that. Um, my last two ideas, first, genres. Um, first of all, you need to know what works on social media if you're doing a public health campaign or selling a candidate, right? This is Hector Segali again. People don't want to follow a brand. They want to follow a person. They want something that has a voice in a particular way and something that's more personal. And campaigns spend a lot of time figuring out how that works. I think that's one of the appeals of Donald Trump. We can talk about that a little bit more later. Um, and on Instagram, for instance, Ted Cruz, uh, his folks talking about how it's these personal moments that sort of receive the most interaction and the most engagement. Finally, let me just talk about timing. Uh, one of the important things to really sort of remember um, is that any campaign whatsoever, whether it's in public health or politics, requires a broader arc to think about how does a message actually progress over time. Uh, this is Jeb Bush's people talking about this. 
um, right? So you're going to move through different phases of the campaign, but also different mediums become more important at different moments of time. So if you think about Twitter, it's primarily a dual screening technology. So during debates um, or big events, everyone is on Twitter participating around it. Facebook doesn't work like that. You'll find a lag maybe the next day when people were posting. So you need to think about timing um, in this context. So I'll end there. Should be all right. Let's see. Okay. So I am, I am Jonathan Albright. <laughs> I'm also tired. Um, I made the trip out here, but uh, please like, forgive me if, I, um, if I'm just a little bit slow today. So my research is really, um, and the, what I'm going to focus on today is really about the structure of, of the kind of ecosystem that has developed over the past few years. Um, one of the reasons I, I launched my recent research project was because I felt like there were, there were not many kind of explanations or answers. And, and in this environment, when you have, when you have kind of talk about what happened or, or blame on certain platforms. Uh, you know, Twitter, Twitter influenced the outcome of the election. Face, it was Facebook's fault. Um, I felt, when I was looking around, I felt there weren't, there weren't many explanations, kind of, especially right after the election, that made much sense in terms of um, assigning blame to more of something that was systemic or, or structural. So I started off um, looking at some of the, the lists that were being circulated. Um, Melissa Zimdars had a list, uh, a fake news list that was being shared. And this is one of many that I started to see show up on Google Docs. You kind of get Google Docs invites to different sheets. Um, Eli uh, Pariser, the, the author of The Filter Bubble, also a lot of people were sharing these lists of fake news sites. Um, so on a whim, I actually, I actually took that list and I thought, what, what would happen if I kind of made a network or, or I crawled this and indexed it and developed uh, a larger network to see not only where these sites are connected to, um, how they're connected to each other, but also for the kind of broader environment that exists around these sites. So when I ran my first kind of analysis, I was, I was like actually shocked. I mean, I couldn't believe how, how it looked in terms of, of the, I guess, I'm, I'm going to call it the ecosystem. I know, I know it's, it's kind of a dirty word, but... So what I refer to that is I, I refer to that kind of ecosystem of the original site was more what I would call fake news, um, and I'm using that word in quotes. And actually, that, that word actually has been uh, entered into the Associated Press style book as of, I think, last week or the week before. So there's, there's actually a way or an appropriate way to use quote unquote fake news. Like they, 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 it says you can't call something fake news, but you can refer to fake news in, in quotations. So, <laughs> so one of the things I started with in, kind of in my quest was looking at something, and this is, this is the very beginning of, kind of the Cambridge Analytica debate um, about how information, and especially personal information, was being weaponized to a point. And um, many companies have done the targeting game, and I think the targeting game has existed you know, for, for quite a while in, in the modern sense of giving people personalized messages or customizing messages um, that are meant to reach specific segments of the audience. So what I thought was interesting about, about how this information was starting to show up was I've never seen some of the, the Google search results that I, that I was seeing uh, that started to really come around um, and surface around the election time, and especially the autocomplete recommendations, or I don't, they call it instant predictions. So when I was looking around for Brexit, like, I randomly stumbled into uh, this top search result, which was InfoWars. And at this point, I mean, very few people, I think, that were in the mainstream you know, voting demographic would, would kind of know what InfoWars or Alex Jones. He's, he's infamous now. But it was just very confusing, and, and I didn't know how this was kind of happening. So I started to look at the traffic flows coming into these, um, some of these sites. Um, so I looked at Infowars, and I looked at Breitbart, and I looked at some other sites. But I started looking at the kind of the more nefarious, I guess, um, websites. And you know, a lot of the traffic is definitely coming from Facebook, or was coming from Facebook. But I saw there was a huge per percentage of direct URL referrals, and there was also a, quite a big um, on a lot of these sites, there was a very high 
what I thought was unusually high percentage of organic search referrals, which mean that this isn't search, this isn't advertising, this is actually coming directly out of search results that are typed into Google. So I thought that was, I thought that was extremely interesting in terms of how, how, how these things, how messages can be served that isn't, you know, necessarily through an ad or through something that's placed or something that's, this is more of a different type of, of I guess, mediation of certain messages. Um, one of the things that that's kind of comes into this discussion is is how um, audiences have the, the the idea of audiences has really changed. I mean, a lot of programmatic advertising, as was mentioned earlier, is really kind of developed through the idea that events are now kind of creating audiences, and, and audiences to some degree are created on demand. Um, so audiences aren't this static thing that exists. Um, audience, audiences are things that are created in response to certain media events. Um, and of course, affordances and you know the uses and the gratifications of, of the of how people use media and, and what they get out of it is also important to consider in this. So I saw that um, this is an, um, an ad kind of a uh, data driven advertising firm called Takey, and I've actually spoken with the um, the owner of this company. But you know when he was looking at the trends, a lot of the sentiment I think this is this is well reported now. But a lot of the sentiment was negative. Donald Trump was the most negative, um, had the most negative sentiment across Facebook during the debates, um, which I thought was very interesting. And, and, but the thing is, is that this negative tone directed a lot of attention to him, so especially through females. I, ha I have 10 minutes, I'm, trying, I'm gonna have to go fast. So this is um, Keep the Promise 3. This is a super PAC that supported uh, Ted Cruz. Um, I don't know if this is still up on Facebook, but this is part of his, um, this, is part of, this was part of Facebook's campaign to show how they could target voters uh, based on this super PAC. So as you can see, millions of data points. Um, they use all different sorts of, of kind of factors and, and kind of measurements to predict or to target certain people based on certain types of emotions. So this was, um, you know, one of the ideas about this is people voluntarily give up a lot of emotional information. And, you know, as we can see, the newer Facebook response emojis, I'll just call them emoji buttons, um, are really about extracting people's sentiment kind of dur uh, during their daily life. Um, and I think that Facebook's newsfeed right now, or their edge rank, or the, the, the modern version of their edge rank, actually weights um, these emojis higher than just the regular like now. I think that it actually carries more weight in terms of uh, Facebook's algorithm. So I'm just going to move past this here. One of the things that I wanted to look at in terms of the broader ecosystem when these fake news lists and these kind of sites were coming through was to look at the structure and how these links um, were connected. So, so not just that things show up in Facebook or not just that people are served messages in Facebook, but more importantly, the sources of, of where this is coming from in the first place. Um, of course, there was the famous Macedonian example of the teenagers posting fake news. But what I was seeing was, especially even with family members, um, I was seeing people kind of scroll through and stop and, and be sent certain messages that came from websites like truthfeed.com, which is kind of one of these hyper-biased propaganda type news sites. But also look at kind of, you know, not just the sources, how this is flowing through other media in terms of a system, and then try to extract what I would call the relationships between these sites. So when I did my first round, it's, I kind of, I had a sense of more of, of, a, of the hyper-biased or hyper-polar um, news ecosystem, but my second my second dive into this is the larger kind of, I merged the, the different, the two networks together and mapped them in terms of if they appeared only in the democratic kind of, or I would say liberal um, side of the equation or in the kind of more far right side of the equation. So the ones that aren't colored are actually were websites that were connected in through both networks. So I kind of, I took the, I took this and kind of mapped it on the side. And this is just like this. This, in a way, makes I would say the, the invisible visible. So there's there's not many ways that you can frame fake news or you can frame the kinds of the scale, especially that this type of info wars that we've created has has kind of arise. But I mean, I think that this at least gives a map of of what's going on. It's not the perfect way, or it's not the perfect answer or solution to solve fake news. But I think that by looking at these types of things, we can understand a little bit better. How this is, how this affects us in terms of ideologies, and if, if you go through this, I mean, this is very, um, very specific in terms of the ideological kind of sectors that are through here. Um, you have science in kind of one corner. You have you have pu you have journal publishing, like Sage Publishers, um, in kind of one area up here. You have what I would call the, the Christian kind of 
the far Christian right. So you can kind of move through the spectrum, and this is very clearly defined on these types of network maps. So when you, when you go and you look at the links, so that was just a map of the, of the, of the kind of actors in here. You can, you can kind of, there's data behind all of this. So if you can go and you can extract these connections in between, um, it does show you to a certain degree how these issues are being promoted through certain websites. Um, a lot of this is, you know, to some degree, this is kind of common sense. But it, I guess, again, going back to the idea that this type of mapping and, and the ability to, when we research networks, it helps us make, it helps us uh, resolve the connections that are causing this in the first place or, or creating the environment that fake or this misinformation thrives in. So, you know, I've used this example. One of the first things that I saw was Russia Today, Reddit, WikiLeaks, kind of all in the same cluster as Wikipedia, so ver like very close in terms of network proximity. Um, when I developed a couple of trackers to, to see if, if in fact like WikiLeaks data was coming on to um, Wikipedia and especially uh, new references from others from kind of very controversial sites were starting to show up on Wikipedia, I, I, I have a tracker set for this. Like you can, you can kind of see, yes, like there, there are very kind of, um, I wouldn't call them hate sites, but there are very fringe sites that are starting to get included in references. And I mean, it's, it's just impossible to police Wikipedia. I mean, the, the scale of Wikipedia is, is huge. But we can at least see um, that this gives us a map for the next step to understand how information is starting to leak into our communal information resources, which are very important. So again, this is just another example of kind of how sites are very much strategically positioned around um, YouTube. And this is Zero, Zero Hedge, which is kind of one of those notorious new sites. Uh, the Gateway Pundit, uh, Prison Planet, which is an extension essentially of um, Infowars. So here's Life Z, which is another, um, uh, this would be actually be more of a health-centered um, Laura Ingraham. So when I did the network, you know, you can kind of see who's close and who's influential in these, in these networks. So when information gets shared through these, like you can, you can see kind of a ricochet effect. Um, you have to track dynamic networks. You have to track this over time to animate it. But it does give you a map, and it tells you who's important in terms of the positioning. So let's see here. I have very little time left. Um, so after I did this, I wanted to see there's another side to this, right? There's hyperlinks on the outsides of websites, but there's also a tracking infrastructure that's, that's buried underneath this. So I flipped the network upside down. I kind of inverted it, and I went back. Um, I opened up a virtual machine. Like a lot of these sites, you probably wouldn't really want to go to the kinds of things. I mean, some of them were blocked actually by um, malicious by, by by my browser. I couldn't even go to a couple of them because they were trying to install scripts. Um, but I I opened up a virtual machine and I went back to every one of these websites and I pulled what was being loaded in the background. So not not the hyperlink, but actually the cookies, the XML, the the XSS, the, the you know all of the scripts, uh, things that show up from Amazon Web Services, AWS that that are kind of these, the, the, like the transparent one pixel tracking that's coming from Amazon's EC2 AWS kind of servers. So actually, sorry, what, what was in the middle of this, of course, I mean, just like we said, Facebook is really the center of the universe, not, not, not in terms of just providing data to the audiences, but this, this kind of supports the conclusion that uh, while Facebook might not be the main perpetrator of fake news, they are very much helping to support this environment through tracking, because this, this, is, this right here is, uh, the picture of all, all of those, this, this would be the picture that they would create if, if I was just a normal person that had visited a lot of these websites. So it gives you a lot of actionable insights. Um, what, was, what was confusing about this is Facebook is very much being promoted through these, through these uh, fake news websites. I mean, the secrets of the fab.com, I would think a true conspiracy theorist is not gonna be a person who is going to uh, like the page on Facebook and sign up for, you know, it just, it, just doesn't, it, just, it, it was just very confusing. I mean, it's, it's, it's almost like promoted or branded in Facebook. Um, but this, this is intentional, right? Because, because this, is, this is the infrastructure that's helping to, you know, develop this type of targeting environment. So that's, that's the most extreme example. So the other thing about direct URL referral traffic that I was seeing in the estimates of, of kind of upstream referrals was, the, you know, most of these websites, you had to fight your way through either a Facebook um, pop-up or you had to fight your way through an email sign-up. And again, I think that in the fake news conversation, email like has been overlooked in terms of you know social media, Twitter, Facebook. Snap, I mean, they're, it's very glamorous to talk about in terms of research, but I think that people are very much neglecting. There's a lot of 
people that, you know, you, a lot of people, Facebook is blocked at work. You can't reach people at work through Facebook. Um, but email is still around, and it's still very important. So, and I think that it has been, you know, since it's been around for so long, and it's, I think, they're, 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 I mean, they say Facebook, or they say email is the largest social network, or some, some people would argue that. So, but this just kind of shows over and over again, I fought my way through these sites. Um, and here's another great example. Um, there was a lot of this type of prompting, like emotional, like click like if you'd like to see Hillary in, like in prison. Um, but this, this, was, this was the best one, but there, were a lot, there was a lot of this kind of repeated types of prompting where, okay, I'll like this, I want Hillary to go to, to prison, and then I'll like be on my way. So obviously when you like that, it's, it's gonna link that back, and it's going to push that back, it's gonna, actually, it's gonna pull it back through Facebook, right? And this is, this is part of the kind of cycle of influence. So I started to look at the, um, the number of likes on some of these sites, and I, I actually gave up. I, I mean, there were, there were a few more sites, but I'm like, okay, well, 15 million Facebook likes for sites that basically have very little traffic is, is just a little bit inflated, right? Um, I mean, a couple of these sites had 600,000 Facebook likes, but this, this is well known. I mean, you can go to any, you can Google buy Facebook likes or buy Instagram. I mean, and you can sign up and, I mean, in a matter of five minutes. In five minutes, I could probably right now go and buy 50,000 Facebook likes. So, but this just shows that um, this is getting, there's, there's, there's a signal boosting going on, like an amplification through um, the types of <laughs> ad infrastructure or, or monetization infrastructure, which is Facebook's like. Um, so real-time location information, which is obviously very important in here. Uh, people check in on Facebook. Uh, a lot of background GPS sharing, a lot of background location sharing. So people install apps, they, they kind of let it go. They don't go and ever and check their privacy settings. Um, so they're, they're leaking a lot of information. So let me get to the, I'm just gonna go to the, um, I know I'm out of, starting to run out of time here. I'm just gonna jump to one other really important point. So when I started to look at Twitter, so this was kind of my first dive, I started to follow some of the links back through this map, right? And it led me to things like this. So by looking at these connections in these network maps, um, I started to see you know, things like very, what I would call uh, mass, mass influential Twitter bots. So this was a Washington Post story. Um, this is arguably the most influential Twitter bot, I, I would say, through the election. So the kinds of impressions that you know, we were seeing on this, uh, on this Twitter actor was something like, this is, this is an example of the Gerfinger Pokin. He, he has a couple of accounts. He lives, this is a real person. Um, but you know, they're reaching every 100 tweets, they're getting about a million impressions because it's a cascade effect through, um, through links, through retweets, through mentions, through, there's, all, there's a cryptographic element apparently where um, images are shared and it, it activates kind of a, a code in, to spawn more engagement. So, when I started to look through these other network maps, so this would be a Twitter network map, not, not just hyperlinks, um, I started to see these same um, actors appear all over hashtags. So it was just a really interesting, again, kind of showing that networks can, can provide a lot of information that goes beyond just quantitative or qualitative analysis, and also, and also give a bigger picture. I think that's, that's kind of my main point here. So this, this, was, this is a word cloud of what, what was in that network. So it's very, very time sensitive. I mean, time sensitive down to, of course, it's Twitter, right? But, but this, in, this in turn is, is starting to set trends. It's starting to set the agenda for the press. And I think that's, that's the entire point. Twitter's not that big of a social network. But when reporters will, you know, when they see these huge trends, when they see things jump, you know, they, there's, it, it kind of spawns natural interest to, to like investigate or to see and report on. So, yep. I wanted to show, um, so this was another, this is my last example. This is another um, kind of link that I followed and I started to see, uh, it, was a, it was a YouTube channel, but I noticed that it, w it wasn't kind of, there was something weird going on and so I, did, I ran a network analysis of uh, one YouTube channel and seeded it, so to kind of capture all the other associated network channels and all the subscribers. Um, and what I ended up with was 80,000 fake YouTube videos that were that were they, they were claiming to have some type of AI system to, that, but it was it was so fast that I doubt that humans could do it because while I was collecting the data, you know, hundreds of YouTube videos were being put up. But it, what what it was doing was going out and it was like pulling uh, text from news articles, like snippets of text, and then repurposing it into a spoken um, article on YouTube with kind of a slideshow 
uh, all computer animated. But the thing is, is it wasn't random, right? This is very political. Um, and when I was looking up some of the, uh, when, I, when I did a, YouTube is, it would be the second largest search engine in the world. So I mean, th I think that YouTube would be, more people use YouTube search than anything besides Google. So I just thought it was a really interesting, so there's a lot going on, I think, my, my wrap up point is there's a lot going on that can be understood better if we take different types of mixed method, mixed method analysis, like in, especially for maps, especially for networks, and to kind of see the bigger picture and to trace the connections. That's my last. Thanks. Thanks. I want to hear more about that. Very interesting. Okay, you're going to walk me through this? What? As quickly as I can. Okay. Uh, I will. Should I just show the last slide? I probably have too many, but I'll, I'll try to try to dance it with this. Oh, with the arrow. Okay. Okay, so I'm already going to just switch to my next slide. So I'm going to talk about um, health and fitness wearables. Um, but I'm really not just focused on that because the report that Jeff, Chester, and I did together um, is really about the larger set of issues related to big data and the digital marketing infrastructure. Um, and we know that, and we've seen here, how important big data is these days and how it is transforming so many of the major institutions in society. We've been talking about politics. Transformations are taking place in health and education in many, many areas. I'm going to focus on health and particularly through the lens of the wearables uh, marketplace, the consumer wearables marketplace. Um, so wait here. Um, uh, and all of that is obviously part of the Internet of Things, where objects in our everyday world are now embedded with sensors that can communicate with each other that are connected to the Internet. That's happening everywhere. We just did a, um, uh, a complaint against an Internet-connected doll uh, called Kayla uh, in, that was research conducted in um, uh, Europe. Uh, great concerns about how that doll can track conversations from children and uh, also raise many um, security issues because it can be hacked so easily. That's just one little tiny example of how those things are entering our worlds and what they mean. Um, uh, they're also part, I think, to understand wearables, we need to understand the connected health system, which is uh, at its core about information technology, where so many of the systems are now in, in medicine, in all the areas of health connected to each other. And wearables are considered to be one of the key components of that, especially as we uh, are quantifying, or we were part of the quantified self movement, as Laurie was saying, where we're quantifying what we're doing, we're sharing our information. Um, and, and that's all part of the big picture. Um, I want to talk about some of the, just briefly, and I only have one slide for this, but as Laurie was suggesting, there are many, many beneficial uses uh, of big data, clearly, uh, as we all know, and particularly for wearables. Uh, and there's already some research on how these things are working that I think we need to, to be aware of. Um, we know that they can help patients take their medicine more regularly. Uh, they can give them, obviously, more control over their own health and fitness. I've got my Apple Watch here, and I know I'll go up the stairs three more times wearing this watch because it's going to give me credit for it. It's crazy. Uh, you know, my body should be giving me the credit, but I'm relying on this thing, but it seems to work. Uh, so many other number of, of ways it can, uh, can help people, especially the chronically ill. There's also a lot of research going on uh, in uh, public health and medical institutions uh, look, that are using wearables as really important um, tools to track what people are actually doing, if they're wearing cameras or on them, and they can actually see what their behaviors are, and so they can be extremely useful. But I also have to say that, um, oh, let me show you this one, because this is kind of fun. These are some of the future predictions of uh, how wearables will be used. And these, this is already being very close to coming to market, the digital contact lenses that can track your glucose levels. Um, the idea that people could take what they're called safe driving internables, they <laughs> ingest pills that can measure their alcohol content and then, you know, make, your, make it impossible to get into the car. Not that different from some of the other things they're using to keep people from driving drunk, you know, the ignition locks or whatever they are. Um, uh, uh, the idea that some of the internal sensors that we may be wearing could communicate directly with your doctor. 
And as one forecaster talks about, diagnose health problems as they occur and dispatch medical care without human intervention. A little far-fetched, perhaps. But the other thing we need to keep in mind, and everybody's already been talking about it, but I just want to underscore some of its features, is that consumer wearables are also part of this big data marketing infrastructure that has been years in the making, that has, has become very powerful, and that has certain features that have called, you know, that make some people call it the surveillance economy, which I think is not uh, a bad label for it. Uh, we know we have a business model based on monetization of personal information, ubiquitous data data collection online and off across devices with wearables that becomes part of the picture. We've heard a lot about social media and um, experts in the social media big data field talk about the social media as a fire hose of data uh, and they're capable of datification of our relationships of ourselves and everybody who's involved with us. We also know that a lot of these processes are very opaque and invisible through the use of data analytics and algorithms and we've talked already about personalized marketing and also the, the increased usage of psychographic targeting, sentiment mining, the use of facial recognition, and using emotional triggers based on what you know about a person's emotions in order to target them. Uh, the affordances, and we've heard about affordances earlier, the affordances of wearables are particularly uh, attuned to being able to uh, collect data and not just data you input voluntarily, but through biosensors, data that's collected about you. So my heart rate, uh, my uh, temperature, my levels of stress, uh, my moods, all kinds of things can be tracked by uh, these devices. Uh, they also serve multiple functions. They are woven into our social lives. Uh, and again, talking about the infrastructure of digital marketing, health marketers, including those that are involved with wearables, and it's part of the whole health marketing infrastructure, have um, uh, alignments with some of the most powerful uh, data brokers so that they can do this cross-platform targeting. Now, this is an example. The pharmaceutical companies are really poised to benefit from the kinds of marketing and data collection that can take place on wearable devices. Um, and they're already involved, in the U.S. at least, in, in direct-to-consumer marketing. We know from you know, television advertising, all kinds of other advertising, and much of it is digital. So uh, one example of how uh, wearables are integrated into this is the idea of condition targeting, and that's targeting people based on their medical condition or their risk for certain medical conditions or even their fears about having a medical condition because lots of people are doing online searches to find out what this symptom means. Uh, and I know certain young people who do that all the time. Uh, you know, before they ask anybody else, they will go online to see what, what, you know, what does this mean? So that's data that can be collected and uh, can be used for condition targeting. Again, uh, I'll just quickly talk about this, an infrastructure of marketing companies specifically for wearables. Uh, lots of research on tapping into psychological needs. Uh, the dissolving boundaries between the consumer marketplace and the medical system. And I think this is very important. We're going to see many more connections among all of these different institutions that may have seemed separate from the consumer marketplace and this growing digital uh, marketplace with, within which wearables will reside. Um, and that means that health data can be gathered from a wide range of sources. These are just some of them and from some of the companies in the digital health uh, field. I just wanted to use this to talk a little bit about the ca uh, capabilities that digital um, technologies and particularly wearables will have for new forms of targeting uh, commercial messages. So if you have a watch, I just got a phone call on mine and I felt it. Sometimes I like that, sometimes I don't like that. But uh, you can look, you get this haptic, since, you know, this haptic message. So uh, I feel it and it can tell me that something's happening. This is being incorporated uh, into new forms of marketing that will use these haptic te technologies on our wearable devices to reach us and engage us, along with a lot of other things that will be used. Um, such as emotion chips that can measure the responses to emotions in real time um, and combine analytics 
uh, uh, information about what your emotional states are from all kinds of other sources. And I've read some accounts of a uh, number of marketers who talk about how wearable devices will also be able to know when you're in the best mood for an ad. So it can, you know, am I, am I too sleepy at 9 o'clock in the morning, 8 o'clock in the morning? When am I up? When am I ready? When am I most receptive? And then also be able to uh, track the responses to ads. Um, I like this quote because I think it's a good, uh, I'm going to share two of them with you. These are both good because I think they capture a lot of what we're talking about here and certainly about what the industry sees as what, how this is all going to work within the digital marketing infrastructure. Uh, this one, your watch goes absolutely everywhere you go, the restroom, the gym, your morning run, shopping, and it's even there when you're sleeping. And when you're on the go, you sometimes might forget your phone, but you're not going to forget your watch. Such rich location data is powerful for advertisers. Stores could leverage previous shopping data to prompt consumers toward a portion of the store that needs more foot traffic or is home to higher priced goods. And then this one, which is a future prediction, which also talks about the way that these devices are envisioned to be part of a whole integrated ecosystem, if you will, which is a word that's used often, a, a manufactured ecosystem. Uh, your smartwatch will instantly access your medical records, diet, and training logs, then sync them with sensors in the supermarket and mall to provide real-time shopping and health advice. And your smart shoes and biometric shirts will remind you to straighten your posture, hydrate, and run and walk with correct form to protect your back and knees. And then you'll have a smart bandage that will tell diabetics when their blood sugar is running low. Um, and haptic technology gives you intimacy at a distance so when your wife on the phone a thousand miles away squeezes her Fitbit, your Under Armour will lighten up. I love these. They, there are all these kind of uh, you know, uses of the haptic technology for emotional communication across the miles. We might be doing that. So I've run through this pretty quickly, but I just want to identify some issues here that emerge for me, certainly, that I think are important to talk about. Obviously, the data flow, massive amounts of data flow through all of these institutions. Um, the kinds of issues around algorithms and discrimination, which we're seeing in many other aspects of society raised by big data, are very big here. And you're adding medical data to that, as well as race and gender and, and, other, um, and other factors. Um, just a glimpse I've given you of some of the techniques that are emerging. Many of them I consider unfair, intrusive, and manipulative. And I think you also have to think about um, not only privacy and security issues, but new forms of social control that we've got to sort of, even in service of public health, that I think are worth considering. You know, how much, it's one thing for my watch to tell me to take a moment and breathe. But what if it starts telling me other things? And what if there are ways to sort of control that behavior that are separate from what's happening between me and my device here? And then I think the most important thing to underscore here, and we go into it in detail in our report, is that there really is a lack of effective safeguards across all these sectors in terms of consumer privacy, online, health, uh, even HIPAA, which has some little protections built in doesn't address most of this stuff, just really doesn't. So I will end with this slide because I think we have to have an agenda for action. I think we have to expand advocacy and it has to be multi-sector advocacy, bringing public health together with consumer protection communities and privacy and civil rights, extremely important, as well as others. Um, we obviously need public and stakeholder education. We don't have enough of that. There's not enough information out there about all this, and we need to do a much better job. I've got a couple more points. Research, I always have to throw that in. That's important. And public interest policies. Uh, and even though it may not be quite the right time to advance federal policies, we need to mobilize for that in the future. There's lots to be done at the state level, and I'm optimistic, as usual. Thank you. That was a tour de force, wasn't it? Any place you'd like. We have two microphones that people will share, so cozy up. And um, it's, there was so much. What? Shut off the light. Why am I looking like I'm being interrogated? That's how it feels.
Yes, I did it. So I hope you have been thinking of questions and will raise your hand and I'll call on you and ask you to say who you are and what your question is and then I'll repeat it so everybody can hear. And um, that it was a lot. Um, there's so much happening behind the scenes. So my question to start with, um, you know, David talked about those days long ago when we worked together and, and before you could have uh, screensavers that had pictures, I had some words that floated on mine. And the words, there were three questions. The questions were, what's the problem? Who benefits? And who can change it? And I really want to focus on the last question. I think the problems are need a lot more in-depth discussion, obviously, but you've each, in your own way, talked about what's problematic about this new information system that we are embedded in. I'd like to know what, what are the possibilities, and let's just start at the end um, with, um, who's sitting down there at the end? Isn't that you, Daniel? Yeah. Yes, I can barely see. Um, he does. And, um, the, and just one by one, very briefly, so everybody gets a chance to say, what do you think the next steps are? And it can be general. It doesn't have to be public health focused. Just where do we go from here? Uh, sure. Um, it's a great question. Uh, I would say the problem, the big problem, is the declining <laughs> trust among segments of the public in institutions, and particularly in the context of what everyone has talked about today, institutions that produce knowledge, whether that's science or whether that's journalism. Um, I think the problem is primarily partisan, not exclusively so. Um, we know that Republicans, for instance, have much less trust in knowledge producing institutions from science to journalism than Democrats. We also know, um, and this is empirically verified, that this is in part the result of a campaign that is now in about its 80th year to build up an alternative conservative media ecosystem. Nicole Hemmer's book, um, her most recent book, is a, a wonderful sort of tour that takes you through the origins of this. Um, we know, for instance, uh, and something I've been doing a lot of work on recently is on the alt-right. Um, I think, frankly, um, media is much more about identity than it is information. Um, I think a lot of the alt-right is about an assertion of whiteness as being a primary, um, if not most important identity, they see it as the most important identity underlying politics. Um, and a lot of information sort of takes root within that broader context. Who solves that? The Republican Party does. Um, I think Republican Party elites need to um, re-espouse the value of institutional knowledge production from journalism to science. I think that's the only way, frankly, that anything is going to change. Um, and uh, at the end of the day, I think that from what we know about political psychology, um, those appeals are going to be, have to be made from cultural in-groups, and that means the Republican Party has work to do on itself. Um, that shouldn't be particularly controversial. There's been a number of people in the New York Times. Um, Mitt Romney has said this. Um, so I, I think the Republican establishment sort of knows this, but I think that's the only, that's the problem going forward that we need to solve. Great, Daniel. Jeff. Well, we've already started organizing on this, and I'm sure others have too. Um, this is a global problem, and one of the problems we, I think we, what we saw was that there was a lack of advocacy infrastructure to address um, this issue, particularly on the digital media and data side. So what we did was we brought together um, the organization that represents consumer advocates on both sides of the Atlantic, the Transatlantic Consumer Dialogue, um, to begin focusing on this issue. We just had a forum at, at the press uh, at, in Washington, D.C. on this not too long ago, but we have placed this on the agenda in Europe in part because that's where the system is vulnerable. That's where the American companies are also vulnerable. Our colleagues have helped encourage the UK Data Protection Commissioner to launch an investigation, which is now ongoing. They just issued a report on how, uh, on some of these issues. The Guardian just, uh, I think the, Guard the Guardian just reported that they're, they're making available ways that people can understand what kind of advertising they're going to get in the upcoming uh, British uh, uh, electoral campaign. 
and we are going to push this issue through as the new general data protection regulation, which will be the world standard in terms of privacy and is based on a human rights framework. When that comes into effect in May 2018, we have now mobilized our forces to make sure that it addresses this system and to put new pressure on Google and Facebook and the American companies for these practices. I think we can start regulating first in Europe, force these companies to be more transparent, change their practices, and indeed, one of the other strategies which we have seen as a result over this debate over, now I want to know what the actual uh, AP says if I, say, if I say fake news and all that, but look, and one of the points I wanted to make was that we all knew was that a large part, and I wanted to hear from you, a large part of fake news is funded by the programmatic system that Google and Facebook dominate. That's what's been funding the hate speech. That's what's funding the right. And what's happened for a variety of reasons, there are pressures on Google and Facebook and the rest of the industry now to not support this infrastructure. So, so we're going to continue our work at CDD with our colleagues at, at, and with the Berkeley Media Studies Group, et cetera, to pressure the system to begin changing some of their practices while we continue to organize and expose and, and and are thankful for the scholarly research that's going on. Jonathan. So I think I'll focus, I'll focus a little bit more on, on kind of transparency, I guess, it would be the, the angle that I would take. Uh, so having lived in other countries, um, besides the US, a lot of countries, developed countries, have you know, privacy commissioners. They have privacy commissions. They have, they have arms of the government or independent agencies that are, that are set up to, um, to protect citizens' information. Um, and the U.S. doesn't, I mean, we, we have laws to protect our information, but most of it's based on commerce or it's based on something that's illegal or it's based on copyright protection. So I think that um, having, having an agency that's specifically set up bec I mean, in this age, in this day and age, is, is very much needed. Um, will that happen in the near future? I mean, this is, that's, that's, a, that's a tough question. But I think that, I think that there, there has to be some type of progression towards establishing an agency other than the Federal Trade Commission to protect, I mean, to protect our, our data and to protect our way of life, really, because we, we're surrounded in data, we, we live through data. So I think the fact that that's missing in the United States is, is a huge problem. Um, so the other thing is when, when we are able to request data, I think this was done with a recent example of Cambridge Analytica, when you can make your request uh, through countries like the UK that, that, you can, that they will provide you with the data that, they, that is stored on you. Um, is that we, you know, we can't reverse engineer. It's, it's, we know maybe what data they're, they're holding on us, but we have no idea, and we will never know because it's, it's proprietary how that data is actually used on us. And this is a huge part of the, of the politics equation right now because um, there, you know, we, we can only find out some information, de geographics, dem demographics, how it's merged and how it's filtered and how it's sorted and used to target us and influence our behavior is something that we can't reverse engineer. Um, and trying to do that and trying to look back in, in, like as, a, as a reflection to YouTube and, and to targeting and to ads is, is like trying to reverse engineer chaos. So until we have the process, until we have neutral or transparent algorithms, that's, that's a big part of the equation. Kathy, you get the last word yeah, and then okay, we have yeah. to vacate the room. Uh, well, I've been fast again. Yeah. Okay, well, I agree. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, no, I've, I've been writing about this and working on these issues for a long time, and they are all connected. Um, I do think we've reached a point where people are beginning to get it, and I think we're, we can start mobilizing uh, key stakeholders around collective action that may not happen immediately, um, or may not be successful immediately, but there are things we can do to pressure companies, we can build uh, policy networks, and we can work toward a time when we can call effectively for the institution, for example, of a data privacy agency, which many of our colleagues have called for, and we agree, and we, we've asked for that as well. Thank you, panelists, and thank you collectively for reaffirming our faith in institutions that produce knowledge and science and journalism, and thanks so much for your participation. Okay. Right.